Are you thinking about making a podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one. And if I can figure it out, you definitely can too. You can create your own content all in one place for free with zero hangups and even earn money as soon as you get started. Spotify lets you record and edit episodes from your phone or computer so you can go mobile just like I enjoy to do. My favorite thing about it is that you can create video episodes if you wish and upload them to wherever podcasts are heard. You can even set up subscriptions or if you're like me, listen to support options for listeners to help you grow. I 10 out of 10 recommend the Spotify for Podcasters app. Or, you know, why don't you just step over to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your own podcast. Welcome back to the crossover between the evolution and off the deep end. I'm your host, Eddie, coming to you to connect you with somebody who is over 3,000 miles from me right now. Uh, Thankfully, I have a little bit of technology that allows me to do that. So without further ado, Jeff Bayless is returning to wrap up and talk about what we do occupationally. Um in the military. So Bosun's mates are very special and you're gonna hear why. Something I wanna just touch on really quickly is this is a, a leadership career field. This is not something for the average Joe who wants to, you know, kind of fly under the radar. They're loud. Uh we say a lot of usually swear words. Uh we have to portray things in a way that is easy for people from different countries, different states. Um, who might not have English as their first language to understand. So everything we do is kind of fast-paced. We get it done. We don't do a lot of hands-off training. We want to make sure that muscle memory is tuned in and also that we are being as, you know, able to break it down as clearly and simply as possible for our junior sailors as a leader. And you know what? Sometimes for senior sailors as, as as a young leader because... You're never too old to learn something new. So without further ado, let's get right into it. All right, what's happening, everybody? We are back for the second half of the Jeff Bayless overall life story we already covered. And now we're going to dive into what he did occupationally. Not everybody knows what the greatest rate in the United States Navy is. But those who do know it's usually not them, it's us. So uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what makes a boatswain's mate wow man uh yeah a lot uh you know first thing jumping in i would say the most important thing to remind people maybe from the last episode is you are who you are not what you do right so what you do is not who you are so i I just want to jump off with that because it's important to start with that but that doesn't mean you can't love and be great at what you do and i certainly love and would humbly say that i was pretty damn good at uh, boast mating, and I'm excited to be able to continue to boast mate as a civilian uh, in civil service. Uh, so, what do, what is a boat sw- boat swain's mate? Uh, you know, I didn't I didn't get time to do research on the 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 full history, but what I could tell you is historically uh, there were cock swains and boat swains, and swain meant keeper. And so the cock swain, there was a cock and a skiff. Uh, I'll go ahead and plug the joke if you want, but <laughs> there was a, and actually my grandfather was a coxswain, CO, that, that's coxswain, right? It's how you shorten it because it's all English where we are from, uh, a lot of our lineage is from the English Navy. And so that's where the term coxswain, uh, which is a small boat driver that used to be an actual rate in the Navy, coxswain, skiff swain, and then the boat swain. And the boat swain was the keeper of the ship. So that just meant you were kind of the jack of all trades, master of none. You were the disciplinarian. You were the, uh, you know, the keeper of the the things that were actually, you know, you were the steward of the ship is another way to say it. Some say, some say keeper, some say steward, but you handled all the, what would be in other branches of the military, uh, Marine Corps, Air Force, you know, the, we or, or army, we are like the grunts of the Navy. Right. So we do all the Navy stuff. Now, it could be argued that everything is Navy stuff. Right. Like we need we need uh, we need people to if, if you don't have a ship service diesel generator to light off the engines, uh, you're not going anywhere. Right. So we need those people, too. We need everybody. But the boatmates mates are the folks that do the old school nautical stuff uh, when ships were uh, sailing vessels that that's who ran everything. Right. We we hoisted the mainsail. Uh, you know, when a when a sail got a furl, we we unfurled it. 
right? We moored the ship, we anchored the ship, we ran the small boats, we ran the ACOM ladders. Uh, we did all of the nautical seamanship things. Uh, we assisted the quartermasters uh, in celestial navigation. Uh, we managed the speed of the ship, uh, all of these things, right? And then as technology and as time went on and through wars, uh, we learned from those. Uh, and just like anything, evolution transpired, right? And so that's a very brief history of what the boatswain was uh, in the granular level, in the in the nuts and bolts, in the hands-on level. And also, we were the keepers of tradition, right? We were the honors and ceremonies. We were the, that's where the pipe call came from. And that's why uh, boat swings wear lanyards uh, with their pipes because we would call. Uh, we didn't have one MCs back then. We didn't have ways to communicate throughout the ship. And so each pipe call was a message to someone on another portion of the vessel, right? So the, the, the boatswain would, uh, or the boatswain would, take his call and pipe chow pipe heave around when we're doing a mooring evolution would pipe, you know, quarters, uh, would pipe, uh, captain's mast, you know, there, there were all these different calls, uh, you know, piping, it's not a whistle, it's pipe. Uh, but it actually, now it's more of a tradition and most people on ships probably don't know what any of those calls mean, uh, or what those pipes mean, what those noises, what those annoying whistles are. But back then, it was a legit way to communicate throughout the ship. Like, hey, it's time to knock off work. Hey, it's time to go get a cup of coffee. Hey, it's time to go to work, you know, <laughs> right? Like turn two, it's time to go to work, right? And so yeah. it, that that became a tradition. And then both mates became the keepers of said traditions, piping someone over the side, right? Which I'm going to be the honors supposed to make for the Mick Pond here uh, just after Labor Day, right? That's a time-honored tradition uh, of a bosun's mate, right? And <clears throat> that piping over the side, that all of these things, we we kept that tradition even down to, uh, we weren't the only ones, of course, but you know, certain tattoos were specific to bosun's mates, right? Like a cross anchor's tattoo on the hands, uh, hold fast on the knuckles uh, was, you know, for when you're up in the, up in the yard arms, unfurling a sail, right. Was, so you would hold on, hold fast, right. Uh, they would tie uh, or they would get tattoos of uh, rope and uh, anchor chain around their wrists, uh, mostly rope usually, cause we didn't have chain back then. Uh, but it was, you know, all of these traditional things, the bosun's mates were notorious for being the keepers of tradition and maintaining the nautical, uh, needs of the ship, right? Not uh, not that we didn't need everybody, but there were just a lot fewer folks on board that even had some sort of rating, right? Now everybody in the Navy has a rating, has a has a title, has a uh, you know a designator, right? Well, back then you were either a bosun's mate or you're an able body seaman, or you were quartermaster, or you were the master at arms. Or you were the ship's captain, uh, or the so gunner's on. mate. I think that was the other one too, as well. Wasn't was one of the first ones. Yes. Yep. Uh, but we had actually in Vietnam era, the the bosun's mates were uh, the master at arms at times as well, uh, because there was a tradition as well with right armed rates. Uh, my grandfather was a right armed rate, and so what that meant was you were in the line of service. You know, we have line officers and staff officers, right? <clears throat> And the line officers are officers that can take command of the ship. And so before, I don't know the timeline and somebody can fact check me, but at a certain point between World War II and Vietnam, they got rid of the right arm rates, but the right, both mate and gunner's mates were right arm rates, which meant you wore your rating insignia on your right arm. The patch was on your right arm. And, you know, over time that shifted to the left uh, arm. But what that right arm meant was, you know, if, if the captain was gone or dead, uh, you know, and, and any officer that was in the line that was a line officer, if they were all not there, the right arm rate took command of the vessel. The right arm mm -hmm. rate was in the line of command. So, so like positional authority, pretty much. Yes. And, and, and in the hierarchy, right? So, you know, command duty officer currently is the captain when the captain is away 
right, for the ship should be underway, officer of the deck qualified, ready to get the ship underway should they need to, things like that. Well, in the, you know, depending on the size of the ship and who was available, the bosun's mate and the gunner's mate were right arm rates. And so they could make that command decision if need be because they're a right arm rate uh, individuals. So <clears throat> that's a very brief historic, you know, kind of how the bosun mate rating got started as I understand it in the history that I've, you know, researched and read about. Uh, and so that, that, that steeped in tradition gives you a great stepping stone coming into the military, uh, something to be proud of, right? If something is so steeped in tradition for me personally, it's, it's extremely prideful. Uh, and you know, as we talked in the last show that that doesn't mean excessive hubris, right? It's, it's important to remain humble as well, but it's also a damn fine thing to be proud to do something that has been around for so long and has so much tradition and history and has been so important for so long. Uh, and then, so what do both mates do today? Uh, well, first of all, I would say I have to, I'll probably go back and forth and kind of bounce back and forth between leadership and then the actual job, right? Because I think if, if in any rate or in any position in the military, when you join the military, you're already forced to grow up. That's it. I mean, we have standards, uh, we have expectations, and when they're not met, they're met with resistance. Uh, so, or with corrective hands, uh, I don't mean hands on, I just mean, you know, being corrective, uh, you know, there, there's a, a reason that we have structure in the military. And so what happens is you're forced to grow up very quickly. And then what also happens is you get thrust into leadership positions very quickly. Uh, you know, you may work at a small company, a construction company, uh, which is, it's very important for you to do your job. You're a very important cog in the wheel but you may not be thrust into a supervisory or leadership position right away or at all ever. Right. In the military, everyone's a leader. Everyone, everybody. It, it, it is inherent in the fact that you don the uniform and I don't mean E1 to E2, uh, right. The E2 is in charge of the E1. What I mean is everyone is a leader. We're all out here to lead each other. Right. When I was, a uh, when I was a young chief, if I had a seaman that said, Hey chief, your, your back pocket button is unbuttoned. I'd be like, thank you shipmate for helping me. You just, you know, kept me from looking gooned up, right? Like everyone's a leader and everyone can teach somebody something and everyone can mentor each other. Uh, but in the bosun mate rating, I say that to say in the bosun mate rating due to the nature of the work that we do, we do not simulate anything In damage control. There's drills or simulation In combat systems. There's drills or simulation. And Bosomate rating, uh, when we do training, it's real. We're actually picking something up with a crane that's three tons and putting it over the side of the ship into the water. Uh, we're actually flooding the well deck with eight feet of water with craft moving around with humans holding mooring lines to these things that are, you know, bouncing back and forth. Uh, you could get crushed in between. This is how we do training. Uh, that, you know, we have ORM where we mitigate these things by having supervisory positions, people that like myself that have been doing this for, you know, a long time. Uh, and, and maybe it could also be argued that, uh, you could not necessarily have, uh, you could be doing this for a long time, but not necessarily get into the positions where you know how to, you know, if you just haven't done it, then you don't know. And that's fine. Uh, but but for those of us that have like actually been out on the deck plates and actually gone to sea for 80 or 90 percent of our career uh, and choose to go back to sea, right, those are the people that can come out and evaluate and help and mitigate. But we're not actually simulating. We're going to do it. Uh, and and I'm I'm going to be there to help you is kind of the kind of the gist. Right. So you also get thrust into a leadership position very quickly. So you could be 21 years old. Uh, and be in charge of an evolution where someone could definitely lose their life, right? De if nothing else, they could get hurt very, very badly. Uh, you could be on a, a boat, Davit. I'll get into the, you know, what, what we all do. Uh, but, but you could be doing something very dangerous at a very young age and have other people's lives in your hands because we don't simulate nothing we do. Even when we go to schoolhouse in the, in the, in the unrep trainer, guess what? There's an actual tension span wire that comes to tension with a probe that comes down and seats. Like just because you're just not on a ship between two ships. So it's a little safer. 
but it still could go wrong, right? You still need to wear safety equipment. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I would start with the leadership portion of being a boss mate is that it happens at a young age. And so it definitely does. It definitely does. I remember being put into different positions where I was definitely not ready for, um, and, and nobody really is ready to be, to be a leader, but you, you can either rise to the occasion or, uh, and which is something that doesn't happen very often. Usually you fall to your level of training, which is why we do these, these things. And we do it with repetition after repetition after repetition. And as we build these, this little, the skill set, this little deck of cards, we can pull from those cards in the, oh shit situations is what I call them. When, um, on the other side, there's of this, of the merchant vessel, there is a malfunction and they have to shoot the span wire or, um, everything goes really bad. And like, for me, when I, as a rig captain, I have a rigger stepping underneath the load and they can't hear me over whatever's going on on the flight deck. Cause we're on an aircraft carrier. I have to yank them out of the way. And then I take, uh, you know, a stack of bombs that's traveling down into the side of my knee because um, because my UI, my under instruction rig captain made a poor decision to um, to not look out for stuff. So me stepping in in a moment's notice, there's not always time to say, hey, tell d- tell them to stop whatever's going on. Tell them, you know, set a bath, shut it all down. There's not always time for that. You got to learn from uh, this, this heightened sense of attention to detail. Um, listening to your instructors, listening to people who have actually done things in downrange and teach you that and then apply it every, like on the spot. There's no, there's not necessarily like a training manual to say, okay, if everything goes to shit, stay calm. It's not really, yeah. that's kind of something I, I had to learn. Mm-hmm. And I learned it in school with the real attention uh, span wire and all these things, just like you spoke of. Yeah, man. I, I think there's probably a good portion of this uh this episode we could do sea stories which would be fun and we should uh but now that we've laid the groundwork it might be kind of important to talk about what you know for the for the layperson what it is a bus mate does right so 100 in in real time like now i mean so you know forward to aft uh let's go so uh first thing is preservation of the ship which a lot of people put down or think that it's you know it's beneath them to paint right well, there's a lot going on there. First of all, it's pride in the esprit de corps, right? That is part of your smart seamanship and how you present your ship. And that captain is letting the entire fleet know how, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. And so if your ship is not properly preserved, first of all, it's a maintenance problem because that ship will corrode faster. But on top of that, it's a pride thing. You know, how you wear your uniform, how you cut your hair, how you wear, you know, how you, you know, how you salute, like all these things, it, painting the side of the ship is very important. And a lot of bosun mates don't, they, especially if they got put on that side cleaners crew, they don't, they don't appreciate it. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Cause if my ship doesn't look smart, that's a problem because that lets everybody else on the waterfront know that's probably how I do maintenance. That's probably how I do evolutions. That's probably how I do everything. That's probably how I treat my sailors, right? If I just don't care about that, then I probably don't care about a lot of other things. So that's thing one. Uh, going up to the forecastle, obviously, you know, we run the ground tackle and anchor chain and, and, uh, anchor the ship, uh, different ships use anchoring in different operations. Uh, but it, it can be a very dangerous evolution. And the first time you see it, I promise it'll give you the pucker factor, right? Uh, especially oh, yeah. like an aircraft carrier, or big deck amphib, uh, you go to the smaller ships with a smaller chain. It's, it's more like throwing an anchor out on your, your small boat. Um, but there is a procedure in place for a reason. Uh, so there, there's anchoring, there's mooring. We tie the ship up. Um, seems pretty, pretty simple, but it can be quite demanding and quite complex. Uh, warping a ship with uh, capstans, without tugs. Uh, there, there's many things that we could be called upon to do that require mooring evolutions. Uh, there's underway replenishment. You bring two ships alongside, you know, hundred feet across from each other in the, in the sea state, you know, uh, put, tension span wires, you know, bring wire rope. That's about a one inch diameter, uh, and, you know, bring those to tension where they're actually pulling the ships together while the Venturi effect between the two ships is pushing them apart and trying to control all this chaos just to get stores on board, to keep the sailors on the ship, uh, fed and also to bring ammo so we can go kill terrorists, right? Like that's the nation's business and without ammo and especially, uh, in a, 
you know, Operation Inherent Re Resolve or other evolutions, other uh, things that I have done prior to our deployment where we did Operation Inherent Resolve, you know, 9-11, bro, we, we brought a lot of ammo on <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, I remember lining everything up in Bomb Alley and writing in chalk pin on it, you know. Uh, so anyway, underway replenishment, we bring fuel, we bring stores, bring these things alongside huge uh importance to the ship the only way to get supplies on the ship and other than uh vertical replenishment which i would also add you know on the smaller lsd and down uh deck department owns a flight deck as well and so you're in charge of helicopter operations never fixed wing operations but helicopter operations at sea uh and a lot of times that can get very 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 dangerous uh you know have Especially with the, the ship listing so much yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so you got to keep your head on a swivel, as we say. Uh, there's uh, towing evolutions where we can tow other vessels where you put out, you know, 600 feet of, of mooring line and make it up to their uh, anchor chain where they break their chain and pay it out through their bull nose. And we attach that and tow them. Uh, we try to get in step and make that happen where we can tow uh, not only other NATO vessels, but we could also tow, which I have, uh, drug boats that we've captured, right, uh, which was not a NATO rig at all. We just had to figure it out. Right. Um, what am I missing? Crane operations. So, you know, we have, uh, so on that non-cargo variant LSDs, there's two, there's a 20 ton and a 60 ton on the cargo variant. There's a 30 ton on the aircraft carriers. There's a, a crane back aft on the starboard side. Uh, there's an overhead crane in the well decks, some of the amphibs as well to help offload amphibious operations, which I'll talk about in a second, but uh, there's crane evolutions as well, which are extremely important in loading, especially with uh, amphibious uh, ships, loading the Marine expeditionary units uh, cargo of, of, of on board the ship, uh, which usually revolves around having a uh, combat cargo officer that lays out the lay down area for all that green space, as we call it. And uh, those cranes are vital in getting the Marine equipment on and off the ship in order to support not only uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions, but, uh, you know, real wartime should we have to offload uh and we had to do uh, after 9 11 like i said you know utilizing those cranes to get the marine equipment on and off uh, the ship is huge um what am i missing accommodation ladders so you know just anything making just to get personnel on and off the ship uh that's a very uh probably underappreciated because we just take it for advantage you know take advantage of it or take we, we don't appreciate the fact that it, you know, somebody had to figure out how to rig this aluminum ladder to the pier uh, or make it fast to the ship when you're in a Liberty port, when you're anchored out, you know, you make the ACOM, the accommodation ladder fast to the ship so that the Liberty boats can, or just boats to get you ashore. Should you need to go ashore for anything else? Uh, both mates do that. Um, what else? So amphibious operations. So this is, this is a big one. <clears throat> the, I think a lot of the deck community, we we think that uh, we're mostly shipboard, and we are. Uh, and there's a huge contingency of the of the uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit, the MEF, the MEB level. Uh, Marines want ships, and and the Commandant of the Marine Corps just put out in his last mission statement, like we are a sea based uh, entity. The Marines need to go us uh, at sea to do what we need to do. The the war we had in Afghanistan and where we stayed there forever, that was wrong. Like we are not, that's not what we are for. The army is for, you know, sustainment, right? And CBs are there to ensure that the army can sustain, right? Throughput operations. That's what CBs do. That's what the army does. The Marine Corps is supposed to be, you know, we come in, we knock them down. We, we land our AAVs, which I'll get to in a second, right? We storm the beach. Uh, we establish the beachhead. Uh, and, and that's, we get the, the people that are going to stay there to use lay person terminology. We get the people that are going to stay there. We get them there, right? We knock down the trees so that those people can get through the forest, if that makes sense. So amphibious operations, should the balloon ever go up is huge, right? And so what does that mean? We need amphibious ships. So we need LHDs, we need LPDs and we need LSDs. And there's a lot of stuff that I could talk about with those classes of ships and what their capabilities are, but that's all Googleable. All of this is unclassed, by the way. Uh, but there's landing craft air cushions, uh, which I've had the pleasure of being an amphibious uh, detachment officer in charge, where I was in charge of a, my own detachment through a MU deployment, uh, embarked on USS Baton LHA-5. And 
excuse me, LHD five. My first ship was LHA five. Um, but so we can embark a myriad of craft uh, to include landing craft air cushion, which are hovercraft, right? Where we can load Marine combat stuff and both mates are in charge of all that. Uh, the ones from Modern Warfare 3, for those who play video games too much. There you go. All right, cool. Thanks for the help. <laughs> Make it relatable, right? Um, oh, yeah. And then LPD, same thing. LSDs can do the same thing. And then we can also ran, land uh, or, or recover uh, landing craft uh, utilities. So that's the, the best way I know how to describe that is like the boats and Saving Private Ryan with the, the bow ramp, right? Uh, it's a good way to put Marines ashore. Uh, very reliable, very dependable much more dependable than the LCAC, but also a lot slower. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, just not as sexy, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, you know, from amphibious operations to surface uh, ship operations, and then there's also port operations, right? So that's all the at sea and needle or uh, tip of the spear, excuse me. Uh, you know, that's all that type of stuff. But also in port, we're in charge of harbors. I mean, there are so many uh, jobs. Uh, there's also like rigging jobs throughout the Navy where most mates can run cranes ashore and stuff like that. Uh, but the biggest one I would say that most mates do that's of great importance to the fleet and to the Navy and to the, to the country is port operations. Without most mates with doing port operations, no ship is coming in or out of the harbor. And that's submarines too. That's aircraft carriers, that's submarines, that's ships. That's, that's a most mate managing all of that a lot of those guys are my good friends and it's hard work it's a lot of communication it's a lot of late night phone calls when hurricanes come in and brows drop and ships need to come in for emergency repairs and ships need to get underway for emergency stuff uh that is all the that is all the boss mates that the senior level making the phone calls coordinating it but also at the junior level actually coordinating getting people there to cast them off or to make sure the brows are placed properly or to make sure the brow stands are in place and make sure that they have the standby generators on the pier. Even just a ship in a maintenance period, it's a boss mate that goes down there and says like, Hey man, you can't have all this hazmat on the pier, all this paint and stuff. You know, you need to clean up your, your pier area, right. Just to make things safe and functionable. Um, so that man, I, I, I talked for an hour right there and I know like it's a lot, but I'm excited about it. Right. Cause it's what I love. It's what I'm passionate about, but that is what we do. And the reason we do it is because we, again, to, to call it back, we are the servants. We are the keepers. We are the tenders of the ship. And I would argue we are the keepers of the fleet. I, I completely agree. I think um, also more than that, um, the Bosa mate rate also maintains the entire history of the United States Navy and up, up, completely upkeep it. The entire time I thought that I was in the military, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is so much. This is, why are we doing all these things? Like, doesn't everybody have this? And everyone's like, no, no, absolutely not. It's you. You're, you're the one going to be doing this. You're going to be doing with every single honor and ceremony that I got stuck doing all that stuff, and which was awesome. I never really want to sound like I'm complaining or anything, but it was crazy. So that would be doing, doing my normal work. And then I switch gears, head up to the flight deck, bring on Admiral, switch gears, go check on my watch section uh, on the bridge. And oh, I totally forgot times, all that. We drive the ship. Yeah. We oh, are. Yeah. We drive. Yeah, ship. We, we are. Yeah. I'm sorry. But yeah, we, we, we navigate the ship literally. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. That is true. I spent a lot of time uh, checking up with my watch section. Any, any issues they had, um, I was, quick to run up the 10 flights of stairs all the way up to the bridge. And um, I want to say, while you talked about us needing to maintain order and discipline throughout the ship, if there was a failing situation on the bridge, I've had to remove up over three officers from the bridge because they just, you know, people call it cabin, cabin fever. I call it uh, screws getting loose in the head. Some people just need to take a second to breathe and they go, kind of go a little stir crazy while we're deployed. I've removed three officers in my career. Uh, from the bridge for pretty much going kind of crazy, and then the the MAs dealt with it after that. Uh, they're not they're not always up there on the on the bridge, but I am as opposed to me the watch. So if I if I know a situation up there, I step over and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm I'm invoking my positional authority. It's time for you to leave now. And I grab them behind the arm and give them a little bit of an elbow uh, assistance out of there. So um, maintaining order and discipline on the bridge is also another responsibility 
um, recovering uh, missing barges that decide to have the lines part from the from the pier. And I have yeah. to, I, I almost went swimming a couple of times doing it, but um, lassoing, lassoing, um, you know, <clears throat> bollards, chocks, anything, I, anything I could get any, on any bits or cleats, um, which are all the nautical things that stick out from places and you can trip over while you're at sea. Yeah. Uh, lassoing those and yanking the barge back in or trying to wrangle a Yokohama in really, really bad storms. So these big giant black inflot, uh, inflatable things and they're rocking like a bucking Bronco and you try to lasso one of those. And I'm not from the South, so we don't do that. <laughs> but uh, it's a definitely a great skill that I was able to learn. Well, I think that, that, what, I, what I was going to say is, you know, to your first thread, the difference, I think, in the bosun mate rate with other rates in the Navy is if you ask a bosun mate to do something, even if it's not their job, you're never going to hear a bosun mate say, a good bosun mate worth a grain of salt. That's not my job. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are other rates in the Navy where they'll be like, you know, I don't know how to do that. And that's not really my thing. Why don't you go talk to this guy? If they even give you that much, but a boss may, if you're like, oh, man. Hey man, um, I need this valve. Uh, I need the gasket swapped out in this valve. A boss may, will be like, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll figure that out. Uh, where's Re me a Red Bull. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> give me a Red Bull and some chew and I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I have so many, so many positive memories from the random things I got asked to do as well. Um, from hand splicing halyards while we're underway in the middle of the night with a, with a quartermaster holding a, one of those red flashlights and me trying to, uh, to stay awake. I remember I threw in as much chew as I could. I had drank like four Red Bulls throughout the night. I was already up for 48 hours at that point before I started splicing. And so I spliced all the halyards on the, I think it was the G, yeah, the G-dub. And I also did it on the TR twice. So nice. I had, I really got to enjoy uh, making my mark uh, mm. along with that, a lot of fancy work all over the TR as well. And that was something super special to do. Yeah. Fancy works. Cool. It goes back to that tradition, right? Steeped in tradition, um, man. I have so many sea stories, like one that just came to mind, which I don't know how spectacular it is. I have some very like harrowing stories, but the, one of the ones from my younger years, I would say is, uh, definitely, you know, I almost sunk a boat one time, you know, you just make a lot of like stupid things that you learn from, from not putting the builds plug in on a, on a LCPL. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of just stupid things I did that I somehow eked through. Uh, but I remember <laughs> you were talking about like barges running away. We had a paint punt, which is, you know, for the laborers, you know, just a little John boat, uh, you paint the side of the ship with, and somebody didn't tie it to the paint float and it was like floating away. And um, there was some six thread, which is some small manila line right there on the side port. And I didn't have like a, a grapnel hook or, you know, anything like that, but it had a, a swab bucket. Uh, and back then, you know, they were like aluminum and there weren't these plastic yellow buckets, you know, like for mopping. And uh, I grabbed that swab bucket and that six thread and I like coiled it up real quick. And I ran out to the flight deck and just, you know, at a Hail Mary, just like toss that thing like a heaving ball, right? Like a heaving line. And just toss it out and like did one of these numbers like across on my chest, you know, like hope and pray, right? <laughs> Threw it out there and it landed in the boat and like smacked nice. and it flattened because of the, you know, the force on the damn old ass, you know, thing. And I was able to like pull the dang paint float back in, utilize nice. stupid swab bucket. But so you, so you didn't have to swim that day. That's good. Not that day. <laughs> yeah. But uh, oh. part of that story, I guess, is, you know, the improvised part, right? So yeah. you know, a lot of times you'll be doing a deck evolution where, especially if you're in training, we have time to stop and figure it out. But if you're deployed and, you know, or if you're actually un underway replenishment between ships, I don't have time always. And like you talked about jumping in during an unrep, there's a lot of times you have to improvise, right? And span wire came over crooked or, you know, around the, uh, or the, the messenger came over the, the span wire and I, too, too many details and not worth explaining, but, you know, a lot of times there's tech manual things, you know, for a double probe receiver, you have short straps and long straps and ways you're supposed to stop it off single probe receivers. The only way to do that is to actually disconnect it and just kind of figure it out. And you won't find that in a tech manual anyway, or you won't find that in a rate training manual. That's just figuring it out. And hopefully somebody had showed you, and I hate to say tribal knowledge because we should not use tribal knowledge, but sometimes when you're actually in an operation, that's what requires discernment from leadership that has wisdom and has experience, right? Okay, listen, this is safe. And sometimes I would say, 
And I, I'm not saying this is right, but sometimes I would say, Hey, don't do this, but I'm going to do this. Like, this is, this is what we need to do right now. I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. Please do not do what I do. But right now I know that this is a requirement. We had an emergency breakaway on USS Stockdale <clears throat> and, um, the ships were separating the underway replenishment ship was, uh, separating we're at, you know, 800 foot span wire. We were probably at like 700 feet. Right. Oh and no. The aft station got disconnected emergency breakaway. No problem. Midship station, which I was on because the cargo station, because we were a new crew. I figured I'd put myself on the cargo crew because, you know, more people had done fuel than had done cargo or more people had done fuel more times than they had done cargo. And so I decided to put myself on the cargo station and we had gotten the, uh, the high line detention and it was, you know, swinging across the deck and like, you know, trying to take people out and stuff. And I grabbed some 21 thread and just kind of lassoed it around the, the, the high line to, to hold it so I could get it tripped. Right. Which at least I didn't actually grab the wire, but still it was dragging me across the deck. And, uh, I went up to the, um, station three on a, on a DDG. I went up there and they had abandoned the station. And so that, that span wire was going to pull the, the unwrap station off the side of the ship. Uh, and so I ran up there and grabbed a hammer and just, you know, popped the, uh, pelican hook. pelican hook. Yeah. Popped the pelican hook. Uh, and it went out like a shotgun. I mean, it was boom, right. Like straight across. And, uh, we had a debrief in the, in the wardroom afterwards and the cabin was like, I can't believe you did that. Like, you should not have done that. And I was like, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but more importantly, I shouldn't have done that in front of the people I did. Cause now they think that that's what you're supposed to do. Right? <laughs> you're not supposed to do that, but. Sometimes you, know, you improvise, I, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Sometimes you improvise. And a, 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 uh, one of the craziest things I've ever heard when I, from one of the leaders, but did you die? Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily a thing you want to tell to some, a bunch of kids fresh out of high school who have never really had a job other than like Wendy's or, or helping their, their mom out at their little family bakery or whatever. You don't just tell them, oh, you know. Did I die? No, 10 fingers, 10 toes is not always the good solution. You want to praise sailors for that are under your jurisdiction for doing a great job and uplift them and empower them to, to step into their own little leadership role on their own. But at the same time, we do yeah, not want not, to give them any bad ideas. Advice, yeah. one time, I, I gave, uh, I've done a lot of bad ideas. So I, one uh, time I was, uh, we, uh, we did a uh, Southern partnership station, which is uh, basically you go down to Haiti in that area to do counter drug interdiction. Which actually it was pretty cool. I ended up like in the Navy times, like slinging bales of cocaine across the boat deck. Uh, like here's Jeff Bayless centerfold. And yeah, I know way to feed my ego. Right. But anyway, yeah, it was, it was a sexy deployment and uh, we went down there and under the cover of mostly doing HADR humanitarian assistance, like teaching people how to, you know, irrigate water and make areas where they can poop and pee and not get diseases. Right. Like that was the main that was the main thing. And underneath that, we were actually out there with uh, two uh, 46s that were folded on my flight deck, which was not authorized. We got a waiver for that. Uh, we were type two level one alpha, which means we weren't supposed to have, uh, we were just a lily pad for helicopters. We weren't supposed to deploy with them, but we did. So my, my ship looked like Sanford and son. I had two uh, helicopters on the flight deck, which you're not supposed to have long-term, right? Basically on deployment. Cause I don't have an AIMD like we had on TR, right? I had oh, two, yeah. two Riverine patrol boats, which I called these guys Faz sailors. And they're like, what's Faz? I was like, fake ass seals. Like you guys aren't seals. You just walk around like you <laughs> are. You know? Oh um, man. Do they have their, their sleeves rolled up all the time? All the time. Like the yeah. Roll? Totally out of uh, uniform. Trying to, oh, trying please. To, Trying to, yeah, trying to, Oakley's, yeah. Trying to brush trying to up on my beard. sailors all the time, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. I'm oh, like, yeah, you know, this one time back in, uh, yeah. Come yeah, on, no, man. dude, you're an OS2. Get out of here. Yeah. Get out of here. I, I would put it out of quarters to my sailors and be like, listen, to all the females, those guys are not seals. They're not seals. They're just like regular dudes. So <laughs> calm down. <laughs> like, anyway, yeah. uh, two riverine patrol boats, which are like these really sick. I mean, I say all that in jest and I'm joking, of course, but, um, uh, two flat bottom river boats, uh, which did not work out too well in the middle of the ocean, but two riverine patrol boats, two coast. Are they, those the soccer's? No, uh, over to, over to, uh, the riverine patrol boats. Uh, you just got to Google it, man. They're like flat bottom river boats that we used in, uh, in the middle East to, uh, okay. kind of like back in the day, the riverines, uh, the riverine patrol boats that we used in. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Very similar type, uh, scenario. So they could go over like sandbars and stuff like that and get in close. 
and, and they had a great mission in the Iraq war. Um, but the, um, then we had two coast guard over the horizon boats, which are basically seven meter ribs on steroids. And those were like placed back aft on my flight deck. And then I had my three ribs, right. My rigid hole inflatable boats. Uh, and, uh, anyway, the riverine patrol boat had never been on a ship before. These were not designed to be on a ship and I was going to launch them with my crane. So there was no procedure in place. There was no SOP. There's no, this is how you do it. There's no manual. Right. And we're trained. Everything you do is by the book. And I'm just like, it, I remember it was, I don't remember how old I was, but it was my birthday. And uh, my chief, who's now a master chief, she was out on the boat deck and she was like, you know, stressed out. And she's like, damn, Bosin, I don't know about this one. I was like, what could possibly go wrong? It's my birthday. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> We're launching this boat in like three foot seas with a 30 ton crane that had never been launched to see. Like we were just making stuff up. You know what I mean? Uh, ended up working out. One, one good thing about those uh, over the horizon boats, though, I or one, you know, one nice thing I can say. Yeah, no, I used to think coasties were, you know, kind of soft puddle jumpers, whatever. Puddle pirates, yeah. These dudes were high speed, man. These dudes were high speed. I mean, they were go getters. And uh, tip the hat to that community, uh, to the LEs, I believe they call it, law enforcement. Uh, those guys, they got after it. I mean, I'd launch those. Uh, they were seven meter ribs, but like I said, they were on steroids. And I'd launch these guys and they'd go out with HF comms and they would haul ass and go get some, you know, some drug runners, man. They'd be like sinking their boats and all these bales of cocaine are just like floating around, you know, and I'm, I'm over there with the crane, like trying to pull these bales of cocaine out. And these guys are, let me be careful how I say it, but they, they are handling these people <laughs> very ensuring their safety at the same time, but also getting after it, like doing what they had to do. Um, and that was that was a very cool deployment. But again, I'm talking about sometimes you got to improvise, right? Like what happens when we don't simulate and we're actually at an operational rate and things go wrong or things are, uh, you know, you have to do things that aren't in accordance with, which most makes cringe when they hear that because they're just so ingrained with, you know, by the book, which I agree with. But sometimes you got to throw the book away because shit went south, man. It didn't, it didn't go like it's supposed to go. Um, so I don't know. That's just a few improvised stories that I have, I guess, maybe. You I've can't always a, bring it. Yeah. You definitely can't stories. always bring a, yeah, you, you can't always bring it like a, a book solution to a real world problem. It's not always going to go smoothly ever. For sure. Most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jesus. I, I, I remember so many stories, um, especially with dropping bombs in the water during unwrap and having to go and pick them up with the BNA crane. And that was just one, one, positive memory but other ones were you definitely um you made you made a lot of people in the military around you uncomfortable because you were so sure and a lot of other leaders on our deployment especially the tr they were very very uncomfortable i'm not going to say any certain names but there's certain other officers that they were very timid when it came to making decisions on the fly they wanted all right hold on let's slow it down and look at this and your confidence uh really inspired your the people that are under your supervision to kind of do that same thing. Like Chief Bronte is someone who does it as well. Um, well, like I, I think I said, I think I said last episode, you know, inaction is the worst action. A hundred percent. Yeah. Sometimes I don't have time, you know, here's, here's a funny story. <laughs> uh, finish your thread. I'll come back to it. I'm sorry. Oh, that was it. No, you go ahead. Uh, so that same deployment, uh, we had a chaplain, uh, he, super good dude. Like, He's still in the Navy, like great chaps, right? I love this guy. And we would be out on the boat deck sleeping uh, because all of these operations happened at night, right? You'd launch the launch the helicopter, which is deck department. You'd launch the helicopter, man the crane, man the davit. You're doing like 17 things at once, right? So you, in between, you're just sleeping on the out on the non-skid because, you know, why go to your rack? You're going to get called out here in 15 minutes. So Chaps was out there to give moral support to the guys, which I appreciated. You know what I mean? I was like, that's great. And the XO came down. Um, you know, he's a super good dude, still in the Navy, 06. He will make Admiral. I won't say his name. He's, you know, I don't know if he would appreciate that or not. Yeah. Uh, I... But I love the guy. Like, legit, he knows who he is if he listens to this. I, I genuinely love him. Great leader. 
Uh, but he would come down and just check on the guys and stuff in between. It's like 2 a.m. And he's up on the bridge and it's like back's hurting and I'm like tired and everybody's just tired. And then all of a sudden we get spun up, right? Like, woo, like, all right, we got to go. We got to go. We got some drugs to catch. We got some dudes. To, right. So um, I've got these two boats, these two rivering or no, this is the Coast Guard over the horizon boats just swinging in the air, like 30 feet in the air. And I've got like 15 sailors on each line getting drug across the deck, like back and forth and oh back boy. and forth. And I told him at one point, I was like, hey, listen, if you get close to that edge, just let it go. I'll lose a boat. I don't want to lose a sailor, right? I had already like told these guys. So anyway, they're they're tired, right? And this boat swinging around and chaps had been out there like talking to them and just trying to pep talk them and, you know, get them, get them fired up and stuff. And I look across the boat deck and chaps is in a bad spot. Like where he is is dangerous, right? And I'm like, chaps get the fuck out of here <laughs> like you know, an <laughs> arm like that you know like sw- giving him an arm motion like go you gotta yeah. go right and uh i didn't even think about it but like years later uh we served together at beach group and he's like hey man remember when you cussed out your chaplain i was like oh no <laughs> i'm going to hell like cuss you out chaplain. i saved you <laughs> yeah i saved you chaps he's like well you didn't have to use the f-bomb and the chaplain it's like I'm sorry I hurt you, man, but you were in, you were in a bad spot, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, the overall view over the optics is what I is how I usually respond when someone says something like that to me. That you know what, you could be right, you could be, but you're here right now, so let's just focus on that. Okay. Yeah. Big big picture. Let's big picture. Big picture. Let's, uh, let's big zoom picture. out a little we, bit. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh man. Well, there's so many great things that you've done in your military career. And a lot of people have great just highlights in their moments and things that they wanted to accomplish accolades, you know, things that we, we stuff in our, in our little, um, at our sea chest is what it usually called. Do you have a sea chest at your house where you have some, some treasured memorabilia from your military service? Well, yes. Uh, my garage, uh, I have the, my grandfather's shadow box, uh, I have my father's sheath and spike that he gave me when I went to boot camp with a buck folding hunter. Uh, but I think a lot of sailors at a certain point, well, I know some of my friends anyway do. I have a whole bedroom, dude. <laughs> That's yeah, you know, just went like went all out. Like there's one bedroom uh, that, you know, it's where I keep my guns, but it's also where I keep all my coins, uh, paddles, plaques. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a minimalist, so I didn't keep every single thing. Uh, but the, the things I would say I'm most proud of are, is my grandfather's shadow box. Uh, he was hundred percent permanent and total disabled, uh, World War II veteran and rightly so. And, uh, my, my dad giving me that sheath and spike, uh, you know, for, for the person that does, I think anybody that listens to this probably knows what that is and the importance of that. Uh, but I carried that sheath and spike on my first ship. Uh, and then I, I realized that it was too important to continue to wear. Right. And so I put it in the same place. So those things, every coin I have, I would say, and I'm not poo pooing anybody that has bought coins because a lot of people do buy coins and that's, that's great. I, I respect that, you know, just like if somebody likes to drive a Maserati, I respect that you you care about, you know, you care about what, you know, that, that high speed or your Tesla or, you know, whatever the thing is that you like, you like what you like. Uh, but one thing I am proud of is every coin that I have, every, every single coin that I have or sil- silver dollar from a, uh, you know, first salute, uh, somebody gave me, there's not one coin in my collection that was not gifted to me or handed to me or uh, delivered to me. And I have a few that were mailed to me because they, they wanted them, you know, wanted me to have one of their coins or a coin from their command for something that I did. And they ended up having to mail it to me. That's happened a few times, but I've, I don't have any coins that were not given to me with intention and purpose behind it. And that's important to me. Uh, I'm not saying everybody has to be that way, but it's another thing I'm proud of. Uh, and also here, I'll, I'll throw this out here and he may listen to this. Uh, Shane Chamley was my, uh, my first class when I was kind of a fuck up in the Navy. When I, when I came in, I was not, uh, well, I went through a, a phase where I was not doing very well. And, uh, he kind of, he kind of turned me around a little bit and then got me, uh, fired up. And so you, you talk about fancy work. I have the first lanyard I ever made, uh, like in 2000, you know, over 20 years ago. 
and he basically made me do it. You know, he's like, listen, you're going to make BM3. You can't be a BM3 without a lanyard. And we didn't have like Orama's nautical to go make, you know, to go buy one that didn't exist back then. You either have, you either made one or somebody gifted you one, but nobody was buying lanyards back then off eBay. Uh, so I have that lanyard among others, but that one is important to me. And then the last thing I'd say is I have a plaque uh, that uh, my, my protege, uh, Stevie Mutri, uh, he gave me, who now he's an LDO and he's going to do great things in the Navy. Uh, he gave me a plaque when I was his uh, guest speaker at his uh, commissioning ceremony. And that's, that's very important to me. So those things uh, hang on my wall uh, in that room. Those are just some of the few things I think about. Yeah. Badass. <clears throat> Badass. I love it. Yeah. I don't have any coins that I've bought. If I ever bought one, I gave it to somebody else, um, like right. a like a family member or or a friend or a gift for somebody because they served in the military. My my uh, my dad got a bunch of them, and uh, my little my little brother has. I think he might have lost a few. I gave him the punk, but I gave, <laughs> I did give it to him. So he's probably gonna listen to this and he'll be like, "Oh come on, well, I'll find him." But, that's how that goes. Um, yeah, yeah, th things disappear in in big houses. Um, one thing I wanted to ask that I don't often, you know, I don't share this question with people unless I really, really want to hear the answer. What does the phrase or the, the statement service and sacrifice, what does that mean to you? Do you think mm -hmm. that there is some, some crazy existential calling that's saying, Hey, I want you to, you know, you have to serve, you have to be a part of this. You have to bleed red, white, and blue. Or is there something that you knew inside of your heart that, called you to this i think well if you allow me i'll answer that question backwards so the sacrifice is really on the families and the people we leave behind right so that's mm -hmm. that's thing one and probably just the easiest thing to answer the sacrifice i don't ever think about the sacrifice on myself the sacrifices i made i chose so you know i i love that you're titling these service and sacrifice but the sacrifice is really on the families those are the people exactly that make, those are the people that make the sacrifice uh, now the service, yes, I I chose service. Um, I think it's multifaceted. I think that it's partly a lot of little things that popped into your sphere as you were growing up, and then you know over time you you got into the the military and you know you decided that you were going to continue service or not. But either way, it was still something that you decided to serve. It, I, I think I don't think it's like. <clears throat> I don't think people necessarily wake up and say, I'm going to spend a life of service. And with that, I might contradict myself and I'm not trying to. I also think that there's just certain personality types. I just think that there's certain people, you know, there's several personality tests out there. Go take one, right? The Briggs Myers, uh, Jordan Peterson has a very good personality test uh, that lets you know a lot about yourself, right? And I think there are just certain people that have that type of personality where they have a, a presence or a calling about them where they're always going to want to serve, whether it's the nation or uh, others or a soup kitchen, or like you are with helping people with suicide and sexual assault and things like that. You know, certain people find their niche over time. And when you're 19, you may not know what that niche is. And so the military is a good jumping off place to say like, well, this is automatic service, right? And I've said a lot, whether you're pushing a broom or pulling a trigger, you're still in service, right? Like, I think I said this last episode, something to that effect about how everybody is contributing to the, to the greater good here. Uh, but it's a personality thing, I think, that um, pushes you into this uh, life decision to ensure that you remain in service right and that again doesn't always have to be military uh, but for some of us the calling was just too great and for some of us you know we we probably were serving in some way even in our community uh i would even say the the rug you know the the rough and tumble dudes i was running around with in high school and just a little bit after you know, I was in service to them. Like I was keeping them out of trouble, even though we were all doing things we shouldn't be doing. Right. Because you just kind of have that personality type. You just kind of have that, that itch or that draw or that desire to want to, I don't want to see anybody get hurt. I don't want to see anybody, you know, I want to do 
good things, right? I want to do the right thing. I want to do important things. And I think a lot of times <clears throat> you get you get into the military, you get into a a groove uh, where you know things are clicking well, and then you see the good that you can do, right? You see the fruits of your labor. You see the importance of the uh, of the mission, and that's why I always try to give you guys and and others that have served with me uh, ownership, right? And and an understanding. It's important to tell the guys, and this may be, you know generational and maybe some of the boomers don't agree with this, but I think it's very important in service to let people know the why I want to know the why I'm a smart guy. You're a smart guy. You, you deserve to know why we're doing this. Why am I cleaning this? Well, you're cleaning this because this person's coming and this person's coming to talk to this person because he needs to convince this person that we need to go do this. And this is important for the country because if we don't do this, then these people are going to invade this area. So you sweep in this quarter deck, even though it really seems kind of small to you, if you sweep this quarter deck and this two-star admiral comes to this 06, that he needs to go over here and invade this place and we can do this, then that's important for the country. Like <laughs> Those are the kind yeah. of conversations that need to trickle down to the lowest level. And that's when service and sacrifice or service specifically uh, starts to mean more to everyone, right? Knowing the why behind your service, boy, it makes it a lot better uh, to, or a lot easier. It, it reduces the pop filter to wanting, having the desire to serve, right? If you know why, or if you can see why, right? After 9-11, how many people went to the recruiter's office that day? You know? Lines, lines. They call the next day Patriot's Day because they knew why. They knew why they wanted to serve. And so if people know why, people want to serve more and they want to do more, be more. And when you know better, you do better. But if you don't know, you're just, you're going to remain angry, upset, spiraling, confused, sad, not fulfilled, most importantly, probably. Right. So definitely that's, I guess that's a long winded answer, man, but I'm a long winded dude. <laughs> hey, you know what? That, I, think that's a, I think that's a perfect answer. Um, what I normally describe service and sacrifice is as a part of you for a part of them. Right. Uh, so I you're like giving that. a part of yourself to the universe and you know, it's going to give you something back, whether it's, somebody paying for your food at an airport or, or somebody, uh, you know, high, high five and you saying thanks for your service. Or, you know, sometimes just looking in the mirror with that American flag on your shoulder or with that car device you have, or you look at your really messed up military haircut that you just got, or, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's, it's looking back for me, looking back on the pictures of me in the military, I'm reminded of something that I've always wanted to do since I was a child. I wanted to give a part of me, for a part of this and to be a part of this, this big, huge, beautiful circle that's called the United States military. And as far as the military goes, there's so many of us that are connected now because of it. This Absolutely. little bit of a, surf, a service and a lot of people have wounds that they're going through that aren't going to be seen in the public eye. I had to help a friend in a crisis situation just recently. And um, I had to remind him of, you know, hey, you just went, you went down range you know, you lost your entire family in a, in a shooting when you were deployed. You came back, you created a life. Don't throw all that perseverance away just because you're going through a lot of pain right now. And I know it sucks. Yeah. You know, there's nothing fun about going through pain, but usually about 15 years after um, your military experience, that's when PTSD is going to come to the surface. And it's not, PTSD isn't just somebody, oh, screams in their sleep or some people are just hurting on the inside and they don't know, well, hey, you know, a loud noise might trigger you. A whistle might bother you. You might roll in your sleep all night. Like me, I, I have a lot of issues sleeping. Not to say that I have PTSD, but everybody has these issues that they bring home. In one way, shape, or, or, or form, you're not going to be the same person you left as. And that is the only way I can see your, yourself as a military member actually sacrificing. You didn't, no one, signed, no one forced your hand to sign up. And that's where the humility needs to come into play and say, I did this. My family, who, and for me personally, it was my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, I didn't see for long periods of time. She was in Seattle. I was in Virginia. I was in California. We, were, we started to, to create a life for ourselves. Right after the 2013 deployment, I got sent to the wrong ship. You know, that didn't hurt me. It, it did make me very sad. It didn't hurt me like it hurt her to have a, a glimpse of the future in the military and it being ripped from her. Um, that, the families always go through so much, yeah. so much. And uh, that's where the sacrifice kicks in. 
It's yeah. hard not to have two people handling the household. I talked about it on the last episode, but if somebody doesn't listen to that, I, I can't let you bring up PTSD and I have just a few maybe closing statements here as I, as I wind down, but the, the PTSD thing, uh, I, I have PTSD and, you know, a couple of things. Thing one was you probably brought compounding trauma into the military and then the military just compounded more. And so you don't, I don't believe for most of us that it's one traumatic event. Now it can be, it can be, but I don't believe for most of us, it's one traumatic event where you're like, okay, that's it. I, you know, that, that can, that can definitely happen. But I I think for the majority of us uh, that, that quite frankly struggle with PTSD, which it doesn't have to be a disease, you can grow, can be post-traumatic growth or just post-traumatic uh, syndrome doesn't have to be stress or disorder. Uh, there can be a way to to cope and deal and to do good with your post traumatic uh, experience. But the PTSD thing, you you most likely had something that compounded that along the way. And so it's again the the little things that you're going to do along the way to help yourself and those around you. So that's getting help. <clears throat> doing, you know, some sort of healing modality, whether that's praying, yoga, running, fi- finding a way that helps you heal. And then, you know, eventually uh, getting to terms with it. And it, you know, the other, it's not really like it ever goes away. And also it's not really like when you got the diagnosis for PTSD, that all of a sudden you became a different person. That's how I felt when I went to the doctor and came out and the psychiatrist was like, yeah, PTSD, here's your your Zoloft, have a nice day. I was like, holy shit. Like I have PTSD. It was almost like, I just got it. You know what I mean? And after a while, you contracted something, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I had to remind myself, well, I'm still the same person as when I woke up this morning, still the same person. I just now have this, which I can utilize as a vessel to move forward. Right. Where it, or I could have remained stuck and done nothing about it because I didn't know. I didn't have any, you know, a diagnosis gives you something to to work with, gives you something to work towards. Oh, well, that's why when the ice machine drops an ice cube, I freak out. Right. That's that's why I have to go down and check the locks on the doors, you know, twice. Right. Part of that is probably some OCD too. Oh, I'm not the only one who does that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm like, did I just check that? Yeah, I think I checked it. But it's worth checking again. Right. Uh the the PTSD thing, there's a lot there and I'm by no means an expert, but I do, uh, I do understand. And the, if you are struggling, it's okay if you have PTSD and it's also okay if it's just anxiety or some other thing, either way, it's worth, it's worth checking before it manifests into something detrimental. So, and it's not just military personnel, it's law enforcement, uh, it's first responders, it's, folks with uh, childhood abuse. It's folks that have been abused in their homes. It's folks that, I mean, there's a number of ways where you can develop some sort of uh, pathology towards this traumatic event. And I think it's very important to give yourself a little bit of grace, get the help you need. And don't be afraid either. Like I don't run around with a banner, you know, saying, Hey, I got PTSD, but I'm certainly not afraid to share and help someone that may be struggling as well. So, uh, you know, Absolutely. definitely remove any kind of stigma. It's not cool. Uh, you know, it's not something to brag about, but it's also not something to be ashamed of, you know, with it's, it's just another thing. It's just another thing that uh, makes you, you unique, right. And makes you who Absolutely. you are. Yeah. So and you're, you're bruised. You're not broken. You're, you're not, there's not, this is not like the end of the line for you. There's, there's definitely ways to, step out of whatever darkness you're in and that's the most difficult thing to get across to people usually when i have a friend in crisis um me and my buddy tilo uh for my first episode of service sacrifice we spent a lot of time walking people off the ledge and it sucks um i at least at least once every two weeks i'm talking to somebody who's going through a a moment of crisis and the easiest thing 
that I always recommend to people if they're if they are if you're listening to this and you're facing that situation, your friend's about to harm themselves. First off, just be genuine. Just have a conversation. Let them know that you're just there. Don't treat them like they're a baby. Just talk to them. And say, hey, what's going on, man? Like, just talk to me. There's no reason to. Let's, let's not get to the point where we're making decisions. Let's just talk. What what All do right. you let's let's talk through this. Help me fit, help me understand so I can help you find a solution to this. Because there's nothing that you've done in your life that you can't walk back. There's there's things you can do that are that cross lots of lines, <clears throat> but there's nothing that you can't build off of and, and recover from. So I agree. And PTSD is definitely not, you know, it's not the end of anyone's story. There are, there's still blank pages in this book to be written. I mean, for some of us, it's the beginning of your healing journey. So there's a story there. Absolutely. And I hope it is. I hope it definitely is healing for everybody. Right on, man. Well, shoot. Um, did we did we cover what we think we wanted to cover? Do we kind of? Yes, we absolutely. Started, absolutely. Of course, we, you know, we started with uh, the traditional uh, historic bosom eight. Then we got into the sort of actual nuts and bolts of the 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 now both mate and then we got into some just meaty topics as well so i feel pretty good yeah. man. i appreciate i feel uh, pretty solid as well i appreciate uh the, the time again and i hope this you know helps and uh hopefully uh you know neither of us are are gurus i'm not your guru anyway uh but i'm just a dude that has been through some stuff that's tried to learn from it and help others on the other side so hopefully this was helpful as well Absolutely, brother. Evolution takes a lot of different steps and twists and turns. And I think that um, if you're listening to me right now, I'd love for you guys to jump on and listen to things Jeff and his great friends talk about. A lot of it's, uh, I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of big words involved and I'm not a big word guy. Uh, all, I've had quite a few head injuries. So uh, memorizing names is difficult enough for me, but um, the messages portrayed in these conversations are life-changing. I don't listen to Joe Rogan anymore. I listen to Jeff. So I really do recommend you tap in. I yeah, appreciate that, bro. Yeah. I, hey, we're all just out here trying to level each other up genuinely. Like that's, like I said last time, like, I, you know, don't, don't be the ship, be the lighthouse. You know, I'm not, I'm not out here. I'm just, I'm not trying to make anybody do anything. I'm just going to be the lighthouse. The lighthouse doesn't care if you see it or not. You know, it's just putting out the light. And mm -hmm. that's, that's all I can do is be the lighthouse, man. And hope that, you know, keep somebody safe in Harbor. That's, that's really all I'm trying to do. And you never know how many ships you help stay safe in Harbor. Uh, but I'm going to keep putting out that light. I think they're going to keep receiving it as well, man. Well, thank you very much for your time. And I think that is a wrap. Thank you everyone. So very much for listening to this point. I am overwhelmed with the opportunity to connect two people together and just have a conversation about their life experience. Sometimes we joke around a lot. Other times it gets very serious. Sometimes we cry on here. This podcast was created to provide a safe place to talk about things that are unsafe to usually talk about. Um, there's no judgment here. Uh, I usually say a lot of things out of, you know, just joking around. And if there's something I said that's to truly hurt you, I do apologize. There's never any reason why I would want to hurt another person. But part of this is just expressing yourself. And sometimes we don't always get it right. So please do forgive me. That being said, I am always subject to change as far as my opinions um, and self-growth. We This is a self-growth opportunity for me to listen to somebody else's life and gain perspective and experience from someone who's usually not even anywhere near me, sometimes 3,000 miles away or in different time zones. And I always take it with the utmost honor uh, being able to do so. So thank you so much for everybody that's came on so far, everybody that wants to come on and is reaching out to me. I appreciate you as well. I look forward in the future to continue these conversations and go over these things that society tell us to keep to ourselves. Every single day that we express ourselves and unpack some of these boxes that we got in our attic, we become less prone to suicidal thoughts, extreme depression, anxiety, and holding on to traumatic experiences. I look at this as an opportunity to open some of those boxes up. So thank you very much for reaching out to everyone who has. 
And I look forward to listening to you sit down in front of me and to talk with you in the future. This is something that is very near and dear to my heart. And I don't always open up as much as I'd want to. Uh, every, every time I get on the microphone and talk with somebody else, it's a new experience for me as well. I'm not doing these rehearsed conversations. Everything is straight from the hip. Um, we're not even taking time to, to line up the sites. So thank you very much for having a little bit of patience with me as sometimes we get a little bit messy in our conversations or, or emotional or hurt or we have to take a second and, sh- and stop recording altogether to collect ourselves because we really do get into the nitty and the gritty sometimes. If you wish to support what we got going on here, please you just reach out. Tell a friend about this. Let's start these conversations and slowly we can work to get the, the suicide numbers down and make it normal and remove the status quo of men and women needing to talk about their feelings. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, that fucked me up or it hurt me. So I really do appreciate you listening. Uh, I hope you have a great day, a great weekend. Hope your family is in good health. And thank you so much for tapping in. If you're willing to support what we do, uh, please tap the link below on my popple. And let's just get connected and talk about this. That's the best way you can do to support what we got going on here is just to chat with me. And let's. I'd love to hear your story. So please do reach out. Much love.